Using primary sources in the history classroom. Unit 2. Contextualizing. Primary sources were created in the past. To understand any source, students need to see it in relation to its past era. This is what we mean by contextualizing sources. On the left is part of Mario Savio's 1964 speech. It was delivered during a student upheaval known as the Berkeley Free Speech Movement. This passage is from our warm-up activity for the unit. Take a minute to read it through. It will be the focus for our discussion throughout this presentation. Think about the background knowledge students need to be able to make sense of this source. Students need several skills to interpret and use primary sources effectively. Here are five we stress in this entire course. For this presentation, we'll concentrate on the one you see underlined. We focus on the second skill on that list, placing sources in historical context. Here's that short passage again from Mario Savio's speech. The photos here all illustrate aspects of the historical context for that speech. Knowing that context is essential in any effort to understand the meaning and significance of Savio's speech. By themselves, primary sources are not likely to mean much. They can't substitute for or replace an overall narrative framework. By narrative framework, we mean a broader story that connects and makes meaningful sources that might otherwise be hard to interpret or fully understand. Let's see how this applies to Savio's speech. For example, why does Savio mention Mississippi as he does here? Big events took place in Mississippi in the summer before Mario Savio gave his speech at Berkeley. Students need to know about those events if they are to appreciate what Savio means when he refers to the organized status quo in Mississippi. There are actually many historical contexts for any source. No simple formula exists for which ones matter most. Time and place for a source are almost always important aspects of its historical context. The mid-1960s were a unique time to be a student at a major American university, Berkeley in particular. Savio's speech cannot be understood apart from some sense of what was unique about that time and place. By 1964, student protests were starting to become common on university campuses. Berkeley's protests were one example. Berkeley was a huge and well-regarded university. It included groups of highly motivated student activists, some of whom had organized a campus political party called SLATE. University officials angered these students when they sought to ban political activity on campus. Information about the source's author may also be an important part of its historical context. Here are some aspects of Savio's background that could help students trying to understand his role in the Berkeley free speech movement. Such background information could help explain what Savio's aims were. It might also help in assessing the reliability of his claims or how typical his views were. Savio's religious background and his involvement in the civil rights struggles in Mississippi may help explain the stand he took at Berkeley. Student groups seeking funds for civil rights causes were among those banned from setting up tables to publicize their efforts. Along with time and place and biographical background on Mario Savio, a number of other kinds of historical context could be explored. The four listed here are all relevant in seeking to understand the free speech movement and Mario Savio's role in it. For example, should the focus mainly be on a local conflict on the campus at Berkeley? As we've seen, conditions were especially ripe for a bitter confrontation on that campus. 
One context, then, could be the local one, the situation at Berkeley itself. On the other hand, that local conflict reflected broader national trends. The upheaval at Berkeley aroused a sympathetic response by students at many other colleges and universities. Other broad political issues also form a context for the events at Berkeley. One of those issues was the civil rights movement, then at the height of its impact. Savio and others at Berkeley had taken part in the Freedom Summer Project in Mississippi to register blacks to vote. Tensions there were high. Violence had flared. Students took real risks opposing segregation in the Deep South then. Vietnam was still a conflict in a far-off land. Few Americans yet knew much about it. However, some students were already opposing the Vietnam War. Many more would join a growing anti-war movement in the years just ahead. However, Savio also spoke about the economic, social, and cultural concerns of the students themselves. This huge baby boom wave of students was just starting to flood into colleges and universities. Notice the part of Savio's speech in bold type here. This theme was one that many of these students responded to with passion. The baby boomers grew up in a prosperous nation with its burgeoning suburbs. Students from middle class families were used to a fairly comfortable style of life. But many also resented what they saw as the bland and stifling culture of the 1950s. The Woodstock Music Festival was only one moment in a long cultural upheaval just getting underway in 1964. So these economic, social, and cultural contexts also help explain Savio's focus and his concerns in the speech he gave. Sources are embedded in historical contexts. Here's a list of the kinds students have to understand to interpret effectively the primary source we've dealt with here. To sum up, Contextualizing is one of the most important skills students need when using primary source documents.